with uh, Raquel Cassidy, who is very kindly giving up her time to uh, be with us this afternoon. How are you? I'm really good, thank you, John. How are you? Very good. Yeah, not bad. Um, the casting in Doctor Who. You, yeah. you had quite an unusual experience as you were cast very much at the, the last minute in the 11th hour. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know how usual that is for Doctor Who. Uh, it could be very usual, but I do know that it wasn't my originally given to me as a part. So I didn't audition for it or anything. Um, the person whose part it originally was, I don't, I mean, I was told that for personal reasons, that person had to, um, had to withdraw at the last minute. So they'd already started filming and, um, and they didn't really have any time to audition anyone. So I think the director and I had worked together beforehand and it was a straight offer, but it did mean that everything that needed to be done in London before going down to Cardiff had to be done in, you know, like less than 48 hours. So, you know, and sort of tidying up whatever needed to be tidied up in London, doing costume fittings, having the, you know, the intricate, um, I don't even know what the process is called for, for, the, for the mask to be made for the um, almost people, for my ganger. Um, I had to go and have that done. And so I was, I was, it, was, it was kind of very strange because I was put in a car, <laughs> driven out to the edge of London and um, ha had this incredible process, which I will never forget, uh, of, of this thing being wrapped around. It was, like, it was kind of like torture. It was deprivation torture by you know a man it was sort of a man in a studio on the edge of the world it felt like because it was sort of civilization civilization and this incredible view <laughs> and i'm like oh yeah i could have been cast in doctor to doctor who or it could be this elaborate plan to sort of i don't know yeah i don't know <laughs> to take a human being and take them out of their life and go now we have you and you can no longer see or hear anything but we will let you breathe through your nostrils so yeah it was strange so when they put you in that, that situation with the, the latex around you and the <laughs> tube up your nostrils, what sort of space do you have to go to in your own head to get through that? Well, um, I think you do have to, because they did say, and they have to say this, you know, is that it, that it you know, you're going to be in there. The process of putting it on takes probably about 20 minutes and then you're in it for something like 20 minutes or half an hour, which is a long, long time. So they do say that, you, you know, if you need to get out, we won't leave you. But they don't, you don't know that you're not going to be left because once you can no longer hear or see, that person could have gone. You know, you could actually never be see, see anyone ever again. You know, you don't know. So I suppose what I did was I calmed myself right down. I knew that I could put my hand up and come out of it. But if I put my hand up and came out of it, Either they'd have to do the process again or they'd have to cast someone else, you know. And who knows, maybe that's why the original person decided not to do it. I don't know. Um, I've done some meditation uh, in my life. And I've done some still, when I was a student, I did some still life modelling. And I think I just combined those two things of, being, of maintaining sort of stillness and going inside breathing and trying to be as calm as possible because I'm a little bit claustrophobic so I don't you know and that uh, that's been much worse in my life but I'm much much better at it now but the way to be better about it I suppose is to to not panic and to actually go right I'm going to breathe I know this is happening and I know that I can get out of it as long as I don't panic so I've kind of combined all of those things and I was also really curious about the process and about having my senses taken away from me. Um, touch wasn't taken away from me, but really it was, it, it, it was like being the, the, the man in the iron mask. And there's one other thing I played really early on in my career on the fringe in London in a play called St. James and the Tattoo Man. I played a blind girl. And for that, I kind of desensitized my eyes. I don't quite know how I did it, but I stopped using them and I practiced not using them in my everyday life. So I was kind of, kind of quite used to at least letting go of that, or at least I had a memory of it. And as an actor, to have that experience and know pretty much that actually it's not somebody who's just going to wander off or do you harm is kind of a privilege because that might happen to someone or something like that might happen if you're locked up and you're kept somewhere really 
dark and nobody talks to you and you can't hear it. Do you know what I mean? So for all of those reasons, I was cur- I, I use curiosity, sort of gentle breathing and let's see what, what this is like. And I challenge myself because of my claustrophobia a little bit. It's not, it's not massive. I challenge myself to, to, um, to rise to it. So all in all, it was, it was, it was a great experience, weirdly. Just that bit. So you had obviously quite complex um, makeup requirements and prosthetics. Um, and Doctor Who's renowned for um, the special effects. How were these scenes where you essentially had to meet yourself achieved? Um, well, as with all these things, I think they put a, a, um, a stand in who looks like you from the back, you know, so they, so they, they make a stand in up. So they pick somebody who's your height, has your kind of hair, you know, and they make that person up. And, and then you talk to them, you know, you talk to them in the best way that you can. I think it's easier when you've done one of the scenes in one direction, because then you can help the stand in to respond in the way that you would have, you know, um, but until you've put one down, it's quite tricky because you don't, I don't necessarily know what I'm going to do until I do it, you know? Um, and I am very much, I'm much more of a reactor than an actor, I would say. So if you give me something, I'm hoping that I will be open to reacting to it and not go, not stick to what I've prepared. So, and the, you know, the stand in isn't you and isn't an actor. So I suppose you do the best you can. I don't know, really. I mean, you know, you talk to that person, you try to be real with that person um, and give them as many clues to help you through the scene, I suppose. But ultimately, those, those meeting scenes were really profound for the character. So whether it was the ganger meeting Foreman Cleves or Foreman Cleves meeting her ganger, uh, they were re- they were scenes that involved a lot of searching. So if I needed to search for something with the person standing opposite me, it probably wasn't inappropriate. It must be a nightmare as well for the uh, the continuity people to deal with what, yeah, what you were doing in each different take as well. It's hard enough with just one person. I know it is difficult, and and to an extent, you have a responsibility to write down your own continuity because they'll they'll they're looking at more than one person, but they're great. I mean, without those people, you, you would be sort of you'd be cutting from doing sort of this to this. Do you know what I mean? Without anything in between, um, and I, luckily in those scenes, they were fairly simple scenes. I think so. It was literally two people meeting. Um, I remember one through a a window in a door. Um, But one thing I don't remember, John, and you may be able to tell me this, is I thought it was my ganger who survived, not actual Foreman Cleves. I'm pretty sure at a convention that we attended recently or that I attended recently, I was told by my much more well-informed fans that it was Foreman Cleves who survived and not the ganger. It's been several years since I last saw it, so... I thought I would go for the ganger. I thought it was a ganger. I thought it was a ganger as well. I thought it was a ganger. Anyway. Answers on the postcard, please. Yes. Let us know, please, anyone who's watching. Yeah. Um, can we talk a bit about the, the leads? Uh, how was it working with, with Matt Smith? Because it was all still relatively new to him. Yeah, it was. Um, well, adorable. I'd already worked with Matt uh, on another show called Party People. No, Party Animals. And... Um, yeah, he's just adorable. He was very, very helpful to me because obviously I joined, the show was already up and running, not not Doctor Who, but that actual, um, epi- that those two episodes had already started and I'd had very little time to prepare. As I said before, I think I hadn't, um, I hadn't read the script. Oh, I'd read the script, but I'd only read it the once and that first time I'd read it, I didn't realise I was playing Foreman Cleves because it had a man in the name and I just thought Foreman Cleves meant that was a male part. Um, so I was like, I don't know which part I'm up for. Um, so it was all very, very confusing. It was a five week shoot because there's um, it was two episodes. And I do remember my first day, Matt literally going, 
you haven't got a clue, have you? You don't know what you're doing. Don't worry. And it was, there was a big explosion and there was loads of jeopardy and it was right at the end of the second episode that we were supposed to be filming. And he literally held my hand. And then that evening, because we were staying in the same hotel um, or apart hotels they, 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 they have for you there, what they did when I was doing it. And he was on the top floor and I was on that second floor and he knocked on my door and he gave me this, he gave me this sort of episodes of him as Doctor Who and went, have a watch of this. And so that was my homework. Um, but we'd worked together in Party Animals and I'd played his boss um, and I'd been really mean to him, but I loved him. My character absolutely loved him. And, you know, off screen, we had a really a good time and we were really close friends. So it was kind of fun because it, the, the tables had turned, you know, he's a, he's a consummate actor and he, you know, maybe he was still finding his feet as Doctor Who, I don't know, but he seemed brilliant to me and, and you know, with a little bit of help from him, I found my feet pretty quickly and, and it was fun. It was fun working with him. Well, thank you for reminiscing on your time on Doctor Who and we will finish for now, but we'll have another chat about other work that you've been involved in um, in a little while. Thanks very much. Thanks, John.